show a bit more about that just now. And then most of this is born on Bluemix, and Bluemix is their um, is their their cloud uh, their as a service platform, uh, infrastructure as a service, software as a service, um, platform as a service. So it's got an enormous number of different elements that you can mix and match and put together. And most of that is, then, is really bought on top of Bluemix. They use it internally as well. So the data science experience is, is largely bought on top of Bluemix. Uh, the four roles I mentioned there, I, I think they're doing this very well. So um, on the left here is the, the life cycle of a, of a data intensive, data centric pro project. So you start, start off understanding the problem and eventually you deliver a solution. Uh, that's built around some data model. But they are aware of the fact that there are different types of people that's involved in that process, and at various times they need to interact in various ways. In most of industry currently, this is very fragmented. You have a, a, a bunch of data scientists simply sitting somewhere working on some data science platform, they build a model, and then they give this in some form or another to developers that have to build an application around it. So the idea is to take the friction out of this process and put everything together in an environment where these people can work together uh, smoothly. So that data science experience uh, platform, what they, this is a valid proposition. They say it's good because um, uh, you can do, uh, it makes system administration easy. Um, it automatically incorporates best practices and it's updated uh, all the time uh, under your feet as you work. Uh, it makes collaboration easy, it makes sharing easy, not only internally within your company with colleagues, but also in the, in the greater community. You, um, you can publish notebooks and documents that other people can search for and access. The limitation is built in, um, there's uh, support for, for governance mechanisms. Granular access control makes auditing easy. Whenever you touch data, it's logged. Who touched it? How did, did they transform it? And the whole audit trail is there, um, which is nice from from a from a legal perspective, but also just from a, from a plain technical perspective. If you have a, a bunch of data here and something looks strange, you can go back and see who touched it last and what they did. Model deployment um, is uh, in integration with uh, is. It's all part of the package, so you can you can build a statistical model, and then you can wrap a, a REST uh, API around that, and it's immediately deployable on the web, and your application can access that and work with it. Um, and of course, the whole thing is built to scale very well to enormous data sets. Um, then the ecosystem is just the fact that they're working with other companies. So the data science platform is built entirely on open source software. It's the primary tool there at the moment is Jupyter Notebooks, and at the back of that are, are um, Spark, uh, Apache Spark instances. So entirely open source, and they're just providing a wrapper on top, making it easy for all those things to interact. The data method. Um, there's a strong emphasis on, on helping clients, uh, end users, understanding how to work with data and how to build data-centered applications. Um, and industry here, especially here, but even in the US, lags significantly behind state of the art. And IBM realizes that in order to, to make their offering attractive, they have to help companies um, realize that it's useful. Um, and so they have a team, teams that can go to a client and say, right, we want to help you, we'll hold your hand and we go through this process with you. What do you want to do? Um, we sit with you in a workshop, we create this workshop, we create a design with you, you we validate it against your goals, um, you implement the thing, we help you with that, and then run and maintain if there's any problems, ask us and we help. Personal takeaways. Um, what I want to see here is mostly positive, so I'm going to start with what I consider weaknesses. Um, two major things, the IBM is they, they internally fragmented to an unbelievable extent. It is a huge company, 360,000 employees, but it's sometimes it's really surprising. Um, every now and then in the session somebody would say something and other IBM employees would be surprised. 
with the data science experience, the guy was presenting that, and I asked him, are they going to incorporate uh, IBM Power AI, which is IBM's deep learning uh, cloud offering? And he didn't know what it was. And I showed him on the, the website, and his eyes was this big. He couldn't believe it. So that's really surprising sometimes. Uh, by, by the way, I referenced that Power AI was in that article, so you put links to that. There. Good. Um, Watson at the moment is not impressive. Watson is it used originally when it won Jeopardy. Watson was an architecture. That's not true anymore. Watson has become a brand. It's a, um, a set of of uh, of different technologies and services that are just sold under the name Watson. Uh, but those the what those different components can do are, are not impressive at this time. The, the value here is the fact that it's all integrated and accessible uh, in an easy manner. But for any specific service, you can find a company somewhere that's offering the same service uh, that can that perform much better. Cloud is big. API economy is big. The fact that if you have a service, um, you, you choose something small and simple, so you're doing sentiment analysis, um, you build the algorithms, and you make it available via API on, the, uh, API on the web, and other people can incorporate it in their applications. This is happening everywhere. This is where people are focusing and where IBM is focusing. Deep learning is big. DevOps, who knows the term DevOps? I did, right, so it's basically system administration for sophisticated software development environments. Um, how to uh, do version control well, how to do integrated um, uh, testing and uh, uh, continuous integration. integration. Um, it's become such a complex environment that you need people that are essentially experts in putting all the software together and managing the process well. And that, that, that features in, in almost all sessions, somebody mentions it in one way or another. Container technologies, big boost using Docker or something similar. Um, we're behind. We're really behind on, um, and we got to, in, in order, we have to do something about it. And, and, and <laughs> I sort of, I mean, uh, I've gone, yeah, I, I don't necessarily like IBM personal opinion, <laughs> um, but I must say they are offering here uh, something useful. And I think it's one way, if, if you're a large company and you have the money to afford it, they're a good way um, to have people that can help you to get where you need to be to be able to compete well. New generation of analytics technology is exclusively open source. I don't think that's going to change anytime soon. I mean, knows that they're embracing it, they're building on top of open source. They're contributing to it. I don't know how much in code, but financially quite a bit. They explicitly support the mix and match approach. And I think this is new. Uh, there was, I know, happened to notice one session where there was a Google co-presenter at an IBM conference, which is unheard of really. But they recognize um, there are some companies that have better performance in some aspects, and you just use you use the APIs, put them together in your application as you need. Integration and interoperability, that's what they offer. Um, and they're, so, so they provide tools, and this is their philosophy at the moment, they're not providing solutions uh, to, to customers, to end users. They're providing platform tools to the business partners, and the business partners are expected to build solutions on top of that, which they eventually sell. And it's up to them to market and provide support for those solutions. So migration is a process rather than an event. For many companies, they'll probably forever straddle uh, both the cloud and uh, on-premises solution. And IBM, even rec IBM recognizes that. Um, and they explicitly support that and provide tools and ways of thinking to do that well. Hybrid cloud architecture is non-trivial. If you do it for the first time, you're probably going to stumble unless you have somebody around that really knows what they're doing. So maybe just hybrid cloud, what is it? It's obviously... Uh, so 
Part of the system is on premise and premise on your premises, part of the system is in the cloud and they communicate in, in some way or another. And, and it's especially uh, if you have very large data sets, it's an issue to upload it on the cloud or if there are governance issues. Uh, you're not allowed by law to have somebody's private information somewhere in the cloud. Uh, there are some of the business partners uh, there was there was really confusion. People know this cloud and they know this cognitive computing, but they have no idea how to approach that process, how to get started, how to do cloud migration. Solutions have to be designed around clients. And if you develop, you probably know that, but it's surprising how many people still don't get that. Get an idea, spend two years building the solution, unveil it and nobody's interested. <laughs> clients must be involved every single uh, if you ask clients what, what's the problem with moving to the cloud, this is what they say, security uh, scares them. And I think, I think that's the wrong thing to, to focus on. Uh, the cloud, cloud solutions frequently have better security than you can ever provide on your own. Um, architecture, they don't know how to fit all the parts together. Um, and my brain strategy, what to put in the cloud, when to put it there, how to connect it together. For the next two or three years, if you have this cognitive and or cloud solution, it's going to be incredibly sensitive to the exact time frame um, and the cost. If you start developing now, you're releasing it in six months' time in a different world, as far as these con technologies are concerned. So you have to be very aware of when you are going to release it and what it's going to be need to do, to do at the time. Uh, I'm going to skip this. It, there was one of the presenters that was not from IBM, she was from Forrester Research. Yeah. And she took, I, as far as I'm concerned, that there's a single most uh, high, highest um, uh, value per minute that I spent there with this session. <laughs> but this will be available for you, and you can uh, browse through it on your own. Um, that's what I want to say there. Thank cool. you. Okay, are you going to do the... Uh, Moving right along. AI, AI Go. Yeah. This does not... Can you hear me? Hello. Yeah. Okay. Um, Hello. No, I don't think it's gone. It doesn't it's not as good as that one. Right, okay. Um, at the same time, this was the conference was in Las Vegas, then I hopped over to Los Angeles and I visited somebody, uh, a friend of mine there, who's been working on an AI system for about 15 years, and it's called iGo. Um, and he showed me the latest demo, and I thought this is cool enough to show to other people, and you are the other people. <laughs> <laughs> now, as I said, 15 years, it's about 100 person years that went into the development up to now. Currently it's a team of about 10 people. And the bulk of that development is dedicated to the natural language parser to understand <coughs> natural language. Um, I'm not affiliated with the company in any way. I'm not doing marketing for them. This is just for your interest. And what I tell you might not be 100% accurate either. <laughs> My understanding of the system is superficial. It's, it's a complex system. Key features, complex text comprehension with deep parsing. Um, it handles the context of a, of a conversation. It manages that. If it realizes it's confused, it asks you questions to try and figure out what's going on. It's got short and long-term memory. Um, the, at the heart of it is a semantic net, uh, a knowledge graph, where it represents all the knowledge, everything that it knows. And you can browse that thing. Um, it's, it's not a black box. You know exactly what's going on inside. Uh, it can answer questions. It does quite advanced uh, inference and reasoning, both deductive and inductive reasoning. Uh, it does interactive learning as you speak to it, and uh, it does one-shot learning. So it's not like deep learning. You tell it something, and it immediately knows it. Um, it can, uh, it, th this is two. Th so you can tell it something like, uh, if I get email. Um, always read it to me. 
and then it's learned a new skill and it stores that. Um, so so the, the data about the world and things that it can do in the world and knowledge about how grammar works are all interrelated. It's all stored in the same place and can all operate it on, a, on the same place. The side effect, it's not working very well yet, but what they're working on is they can, you can tell it about grammar rules um, in natural language. So you can say something, this is not true, but um, uh, a noun is always preceded by an adjective. And it will understand that you're talking about grammar and it will incorporate that in its nat natural language parsing engine. Just like that. Right, uh, I'm gonna show you how this works. I'm just hoping I can get. Yes, yes. Yes. I'm just hoping I can get sound working. Oh, but you're uh, there's actually a there's a cable here that I didn't even use to be the mic there. But, uh, Is there a yeah. Sound we used it the previous time. Uh, but let's just see maybe this works well enough. Just put it as a It's conversational engine. Um, I mean, it's not all that it can do, but this is what the demo is about. And of course, you can have it in many applications. The, the application, demo application here is as a, a companion to all the people, sort of a, a virtual assistant. Um, and Igo is on the left, and Paul, the older person, is on the right. And they are conversing. Well, let's see. My favorite wine is Etna Rosso, and I don't like white wine. More seriously, I have three grown children. My daughter Sarah has two boys. James, my son, is a ten-year-old girl. And my youngest daughter June is single. Where do they live? June lives in Redondo Beach, and Sarah is in Austin. James is in the Bay Area with his daughter. Where is Redondo Beach? In Los Angeles. Bill just received an email from his son James. Bill, you just got an email from your son. Would you like me to read it? Roger. I don't know what Roger means. <laughs> no, Roger is the same as yes. Got it. Here is the email. So, so in, in the first part here, um, I was just getting lots of information. And then a bit later on, we'll see how we can query that information. So it's just learning, learning, learning. Hi, Matt. I'm on my flight to Chicago and thought I'd shoot you a quick email. I heard that you had fun in Maui with Lily. Hey, Katie just won a reading competition at school. You should congratulate her. Did you hear that June has signed up for a Tough Mudder event? How crazy is that? 
I've been meaning to tell you, I just bought a 20-foot fishing boat, just like the one that you had. Its top speed is 14 knots. Katie says it's super fast. It also has the same 50 horsepower Evan root engine. I sold my 18-foot sailboat to my neighbor because it's too slow. Oh, remember, the fishing trip I'm taking you on is in June. We should also plan for the hiking trip. It'll be in late July or early August. Sarah told me she bought you a Fitbit. The default 4,000 steps goal should be perfect to prepare for the hiking trip. Love, James. Who's Lynn? So I go at this point, um, previously has learned all about family relationships. So he knows um, you can have daughters and sons and fathers and mothers. Um, and as it goes, it's fitting uh, all that into that larger knowledge base. So now we picked up, there's a name that it's never heard before. Lee. Lily Lane is my girlfriend. Bill is calling his granddaughter Katie. I go is listening. <laughs> hey, Grandpa, what's up? Hi, Katie, nothing much. What have you been up to? Well, <coughs> Dad told me he used to go to this TVUC in Santa Barbara, and he took me there last week. I want to go to the same school when I grow up. Good choice, Katie. That's a great school. Hey, I heard that you won a competition. Congratulations. Thanks, Grandpa. The story I read was about some men who got rescued from a remote island. Can I read it to you? I think you'll like it. Sure, I would love that. Okay, here it is. The men rescued in this tale of three castaways were not named Tom Hanks or Gilligan or Robinson Crusoe, though they might as well have been. In a scene straight from Hollywood, a U.S. Navy plane spotted the word help spelled out in palm fronds on a beach. It was on a deserted island in the remote Pacific. The three men had been missing for three days. A wave had overtaken the skiff they were traveling in. The men were found waving their orange life jackets on the teeny Micronesian island of Fanatic. The island is several hundred miles north of Papua New Guinea, officials said April 9th. The men's families reported them missing April 5th after they failed to show up at the Micronesian island of Buido where they were traveling from their home island, Pula. Two cargo ships searched a combined 17 hours for the men as part of AMFR. It is a Coast Guard voluntary search and rescue program. With AMFR, rescue coordinators can identify participating ships in the area of distress and ask them to help. Katie, you're a beautiful reader. Thanks, Grandpa. That reminds me. I got a new computerized companion named Daigo. It can talk and read almost as beautifully as you. Do you want to ask it some questions to see what it learned? Okay, sure. Let me think. I know. What did a U.S. Navy plane see? The word help spelled out in palm fronds on a beach on a deserted island in the Pacific. Whoa, you did understand the story. Where is the island of Benedict? Several hundred miles north of Papua New Guinea. What is Amber? A voluntary search and rescue Coast Guard program. What can rescue coordinators do with Amber? Identify participating ships in the area of distress and ask them to help. Pretty cool, Grandpa. I know. Hey, did you hear that your Aunt June will be participating in the Tough Mudder? No. What is that? I go. Tell Katie and me about Tough Mudder. I don't know that. Let me look that up. I go through reading Wikipedia. Tough Mudder is an endurance event series that was designed and created by a British Harvard Business School postgraduate and a former. It's not just um, quoting there, it's read a paragraph and it's summarizing it. <laughs> Corporate lawyer and tests mental and physical strength. What do participants do? Attempt the 10, 12 mile long military style obstacle courses. What do you know about the obstacles? The obstacles often play on common human fears, such as fire, water, electricity, and heights. Wow, where did you get that? Wikipedia. <laughs> 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 yeah, 
Neil, let's go over your commission this afternoon. Your total sales amount for this month is $88,520. Meet me at 3 p.m. at the club on Alameda Street, okay? I'll be there. Incoming call from Sarah. Hey, Dad. I found your lucky golf club. It was in the attic behind the lazy boy. Notice there's now a meeting at a club and there's a golf club. So there's chance for ambiguity there. <laughs> I'll bring it along next time I visit. That would be nice. Gotta run. Talk to you later. No talks to Igo. Igo, I'm meeting James shortly to discuss my commissions. Where is the club? On Alameda Street. How much was the sales amount? $88,520. Can you calculate my sales commission? I don't know how to calculate your sales commission. Can you teach me? Multiply the amount by 12.5%. That's it. Got it. So, calculate my sales commission. $11,065. Calculate my sales commission on $10,000. $1,215. Awesome. You are a quick learner. By the way, my daughter from California is coming to visit me. When is the visit? Next week. When is the trip? Which trip? The hiking trip. In late July or early August. Thanks. No, I please order two bottles of my favorite red. Sure, two bottles of Etna Rosso. Actually, make that three. Okay, I order three bottles of Etna Rosso. Later this evening, Sarah contacts Igo privately. I know. How many steps did Bill take today? Eighteen hundred. <laughs> Please ask him to call me. Okay. I go contact Bill. Please call Sarah Bill. Thanks. I didn't know you took messages too. I'm impressed. Let's see how smart you are. Does my son have any children? Yes. Sarah is to Bill as Katie is to whom? James. Why did James sell? Can we do analogies um, like that? Let's vote. Because it is too slow. Who has it now? James's neighbor. Who used to own it before? James. Is it longer than the fishing boat? No, shorter. Is the 50 horsepower engine part of the fishing boat? Yes. Is the fishing boat super fast? Yes. Who told you that? Katie said that. I know. Don't believe everything Katie says. <laughs> With everything it learns, it um, stores, it's connected to the source, where it got it, and with time it builds a credibility rating for every source. <laughs> so, if there's contradiction, then it chooses the one with the highest rating. For super fast boats, 43 knots. How fast is the fishing boat? 14 knots. What did my granddaughter win? A reading competition. Does Katie plan to go to USC? No, to this tiny UC in Santa Barbara. Where did Sarah find the club? In the attic, behind the lazy boy. Who was coming to visit me? June. Which wine don't I like? White wine. What did Sarah buy me? A Fitbit. What will Sarah buy? I don't know. Who is... Uh, it's aware of time and tenses, so it's not just uh, oh. she bought... Um, Sarah by Club Bull, uh, it knows it happened or it's going to happen. It's Lily's boyfriend. You. Does Tough Mudder test spiritual strength? No. Mental and physical strength. Pico can also do reminders and lists, play music, control heart automation, or the natural language and integrate it with the rest of its knowledge about family and friends. Hello, Bill. How does it do this? Yeah. Does it just do you want this?
Okay. Um, this is just a, a very high level overview of the architecture. It, it's obviously quite a complex system. Um, so I'm, I'm just going to run you through it quickly. So there's natural language input that goes into a event queue. So I go at the moment as a single sense, and it's this event queue of, of text coming in. Uh, that goes uh, into the natural language parser, which is the bulk of development at this time. And there are uh, about six or seven different stages there, elements. And uh, first is a tokenizer, just breaks it up into, into words, sentence. Um, and then the, the idea, the output of this thing is a parse tree, where the sentence is broken up into parts of speech, uh, subject, object, verb, adjective, and so on. Um, the, the difficult or salient difficult parts there is pronoun resolution. If you say he or she, who, who are you talking about? And clause attachment resolution. Um, if you have a complex sentence, um, so uh, I shot the elephant in my pajamas. Can either mean that I was in my pajamas when I shot the elephant, or the elephant was wearing my pajamas when I shot it? Um, and I look and figure out that sort of thing. And it, it's capable of doing that because that semantic net, its knowledge base, feeds back into this natural language processor, a parser. So all the time it can query existing knowledge um, and to disambiguate. Now, that grammar rule system, um, They've developed their own internal language of representing grammar rules. And of that 10 man team, three people are programmers, uh, and seven of them are what uh, they call AI psychologists uh, internally. And they are mostly people with linguistic background. And they all work in this specialized um, language uh, that represents grammar in some way or another. So mm, the bulk of the effort at this time is going into that. And this is also, Jacques said, he, he thinks it may be brittle. I, I have the same worry there. Um, you're sitting, at the moment, it's thousands of grammar rules, and they weight it by hand. And new rules are added by hand, then it doesn't quite work, and then you have to fiddle and go change another rule, change the weighting. So I think that, that sort of thing one would typically want to do adaptively, train it on a corpus of examples, rather than try to put that together by hand. Um, so as it runs through this uh, sentence word by word, it builds the parse tree and it keeps um, a, a list of hypotheses about how the sentence is parsed. And it rates them, um, and at the end it just chooses the highest rated one, and, and then that's the parse tree that it, that it spits out. Now, that parse tree uh, is all in its, its words and its parts of speech, then it's converted into their own uh, conceptual presentation that's compatible with the way that it's stored in the semantic net. And that's put into the semantic net as new knowledge, um, and it interacts with the inference engine, um, which also picks up if you're asking a question or if you're just giving it information. And if you do ask a question, uh, it finds the answer within this knowledge graph, and then it turns that internal representation back into natural language, into a natural language answer, um, and, and it spits that out. Yeah, so that's just an example, so um, I'm not gonna skip that. And then the company uh, is called AGI Innovations. And it's just, that's just the team. So the guy in the top left there is Peter Foss. Um, it's his architecture, which has been driving for 50 years. And these are the rest of the people working with him. Okay. Pardon? And okay. It's important now. 15 years is a long time. Yes. It's a long time. <laughs> that's my story. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Um, we, uh, I think there is some food and drinks still outside. If you want to network, this is what this is about as well. Um, but thank you very much. Thank you much, Rick. I think it was awesome. Very interesting. Very interesting.
Um, it's, it's just amazing what you can do uh, with a little with symbolic based system. This is it's just amazing. Um, anyway, okay, great stuff. Thank you very much for attending and uh, yep, it's time for network and uh, have a nice chat. Thanks. Cheers. Bye bye.